Uh, I'm honored to share the stage today um, uh, with these folks um, and act as the moderator for this panel. Um, the goal of this panel is uh, to hopefully uh, give you some information about uh, the different cross-platform development systems that are available today. Um, hopefully there are some people in the audience that are um, uh, at the point where they're considering um, what technologies to use to develop a game or um, to port a game. And um, there are a number of technologies available out there to do that. Um, we've got representatives of uh, three of um, the best of them here today. And um, we want to give you some information uh, that will help you make those technical decisions. It is going to be a fairly technical talk. Um, can I get just a show of hands? Uh, uh, who here is a developer or co comfortable with technical uh, discussions? We can we can steer our conversation one way or another if we're okay. It's a bit of a mix, so we'll uh, we'll try and not to uh, to get too deep in the weeds. Um, so uh, I'm going to hand uh, uh, over to the panelists to introduce themselves. But very briefly, this is John from Unity. This is Joshua from OpenFL, and this is Oleg from King. There we go. Hi, so I'm John Elliott from uh, Unity. I'm a technical director there. Uh, I run a team that we're calling the Spotlight team that works with customers using Unity and to help them make showcase games using Unity. Um, I've been in the games industry for about 20 years now. I've done console games, I've done PC games, I've done mobile, I've done web, like I've done a bit of everything. Uh, most recently, before coming to Unity, I was running my own studio, Dynamite. We did a few games using Unity. Uh, the biggest one was Counter Spy, which was on all the PlayStation platforms as well as mobile, so iOS and Android. Um, so, yeah, and I think I love using Unity, so I'll be chatting about that. I'm Joshua. Um, I've been, um, man I created OpenFL three years ago, but really the project started about six years ago. I've uh, been working on that, doing cross-platform development. Uh, during that time, I was one of the lead evangelists for BlackBerry. Uh, I was the lead uh, developer relations for native developers for Palm Web OS, um, RIP, but um, for Palm Web OS. And then before that, I uh, owned a couple different production studios, did a lot of different client work for web and flash and uh, other things like that. So I apologize for the cold. But looking forward to the panel. Yeah, so uh, my name is Oleg. I work for King at uh, King's um, industrial division. So we um, released recently a game engine that has, has been in use internally at King. Um, now it's available publicly for everybody. It's free and it's cool and um, and all that for mobiles and uh, HTML5, like proper HTML5 that actually works. Before that, I worked in game development and before that, I worked, I spent six years at Unity, so deep background in the industry. Great, thanks. Uh, so to kick it off, I thought uh, we'd start with a question to frame the discussion, um, which is why cross-platform? Why not just do native development um, for each individual platform that you're interested in targeting? Yeah, I can start. So, I mean, I think whenever you're thinking about a, a project you're going to start, there's always a bit of a trade-off there. You know, you have to look at the skills of your team and what you're trying to achieve. Um, you know, and potentially there might be an argument that if you want to pick one platform and just really own that and do a really great job on that platform, you might want to just do a custom engine that just runs there and takes full advantage of what that hardware can offer. But most of the time, you know, we want to make money from our games. We want to be able to target as many devices as possible, get to as many consumers as possible. And so, you know, you really want to think about, do you want to spend your time writing an engine for lots of different platforms, or do you want to spend that same amount of time adding features to your game that can differentiate it from all the other games out there in the market? And so, you know, there's a trade-off depending on, like I said, who you have on your team or where your passions lie. But, you know, I think for me at least, it feels like having the ability to target new platforms without having to spend a lot of time building up the tech to support it is, is always going to give you a lot more flexibility and a, can be a win in the long run. 
Uh, yeah, I mean, I would agree. The, um, probably the highlight here is that if you really, really, really know what you're doing, you may actually focus on, on a single platform. But if you're uh, just like everyone in the industry, uh, you know, just doing games, and then uh, and then you're aware that tomorrow just some other platform might just you know pop up and be the next big thing, and you're like, oh snap! And my engine doesn't work on that, and like I've been working on that, and like I have a huge game. So that's where um, having someone to make the engine for you actually works. Yeah, in a sense, I think it comes down to how many times do you want to write your code. And for me, once is enough. Uh, if you are genuinely writing different things, I think that makes sense. But if every time I wrote an email, I had to write it in English and French and German, uh, it would hamper my ability to communicate freely, uh, to just write and focus on the content of what you're writing and move on to the next step. I think that by enabling cross-platform tools, it really makes it a business decision instead of a technical decision, whether you support a platform. And I think that uh, you know, we have seen the number of mobile platforms decreasing, but we never really know. Uh, mobile has been kind of the next industry or the next market moving from the web, but it could be consoles or it could be going back to the web. It, there's kind of the whole, there is nothing new under the sun type of cycle that happens. And so uh, on day one, when you create a product, you might decide this is a mobile only product. But then there may come a day where it's like, wait a second, actually there's a whole market on the web and I want to deliver it there. And you really want to have the flexibility of making that choice as a business rather than looking at a development team and saying, gosh, guys, we've got to rewrite this thing from scratch. Yeah. So what do you think are some of the important considerations that um, developers should uh, take into account when deciding on a cross-platform development technology? the team that you have, okay. like look into a team, talk to them if you haven't. <laughs> uh -huh. uh, like what, what's the skill set um, and what, what, what the passion is. Um, like uh, if you have a set of C++ guys, go make them, you know, script in Lua or JavaScript. Um, you can force them, but then they're going to leave. Or uh, look in, into the talent, uh, in, in, into the artsy talent. Like, wh what's what's their what's their environment? What's their passion? And uh, I mean, you can you can force people to use the tools that they don't like, but in most cases, they wouldn't be productive. Yeah, I mean, I think I can follow up to that. Like, clearly, the team you have makes a big difference to the, the tech you want to choose, um, but. I think also when you're evaluating it, you want to look at the kind of community that comes with it. Like, how hard is it to hire other people? Are they familiar with that technology? Are they familiar with the languages they're going to have to code in? Um, you know, and then, you know, using Unity as an example, you obviously have additional things like the asset store where you can buy, you know, art pa packages, you can buy code, um, and then, you know, the sort of services that we're rolling out where we have kind of analytics and ads all kind of wrapped up into the engine. You know, these are all things that may be useful to you depending on the game you're building. You know, and so you really want to look at that whole ecosystem and just decide what is it we actually need from this game and what is it going to take us to build all those pieces and how much of that can you get either for free or much cheaper by bringing in some technology. Um, you know, and so clearly you want the pa your team to be passionate about it, but it's also you may need to hire a whole new team if this is a new project. So, you know, there's, there's a lot to sort of evaluate. And I think you want to try and pull all those pieces together rather than just being very focused on the kind of pure technical features of any one engine. Yeah, and I, I think in a sense, kind of like the idea of writing my emails in multiple languages, there's the, the scenario of, you know, like, like Oleg was saying, kind of influency. And if I have an idea in my head, Successful communication is to take that idea and give that idea to you. And it's not really about the words I use, it's about transferring that and painting that picture so that you see the same thing that I see. And if I can, I'm a native English speaker, so if I use English, I'm going to be best suited and best equipped to try and, try and accomplish that. So as a developer, uh, the languages that people use and the paradigms that they use is really important for them being able to freely express what they're trying to create. But on the technical side as well, I think that there is potentially the issue of 
is this well suited for what I'm created? If you want to create a mobile game, even if you're really good at PHP, it's probably the wrong language for it. So <laughs> some languages are better for, there are, we have languages for writing music and notating music, and we have languages for speaking and communicating. And so you know, not every fr framework might really be well suited for 2D or 3D or VR or other things that you're looking at. There is one more thing we've discussed that like, well, we have a team, then we have like a game in mind. Um, the, also an important thing to consider when picking a technology is actually mm, the, the shipping process. Like how, how do, mm, how do you gonna, how are you gonna ship the game? Like um, just, you know, just mm, uploading the APK to the marketplace doesn't actually work. So m m maybe you would need to assemble a community on Steam. Maybe you have resources to, you know, pre-warm the community by publishing, say, a web version of the game. And um, so when you figure out the path to the market, like the publishing process, um, maybe you will figure out with additional specifications for a game engine uh, or for technology that, that you're choosing. Maybe you would actually want, like, the, um, the game engine to actually support HTML5 and Steam or maybe you know, maybe maybe you're speaking to Sony guys and actually want to consider consoles, despite you're working on a 2D game. But like, if if like there are some business relations, it's 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 like the what I'm trying to say that business decisions also should be included uh, when considering technology. I think one one final thought. Um, just you talking about fluency made me think of this that. You know, another big consideration for any kind of engine or technology you pick is just how fast you can iterate. Because at the end of the day, the quality of the product you build is all about how fast you, how many times you can iterate on it, how many, how quickly can you try an idea, see the result, decide if it's good, decide if it's fun, you know, decide if it's hitting whatever goals you've set for that feature. Um, and so, you know, I think there's a kind of a point when if you can iterate in seconds rather than minutes or hours, you can really like exponentially increase the quality on your game because you try things that you would never even f think about trying. Um, and so, you know, again, when you're looking at which technology, you want to think about, okay, how quickly can I get results with this? Because it keeps your team excited and passionate when they can get results quickly and try things quickly. Um, and so I feel like that's another important part of any kind of technology choice you make. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, the three uh, technologies that we have represented up here have um, very different technical approaches to achieving um, cross-platform uh, gameplay. Um, I thought it would be useful for the audience if each of you could briefly, at, a, at least at a high level, give a description of how your technology achieves uh, cross-platform. Well, I'll start because I think OpenFL is probably the most unusual of the three represented here. So OpenFL uses a language called Hacks. Um, anyone who knows how to write JavaScript or C-sharp or ActionScript, it's ECMAScript based. So any of those languages, it's very familiar. Uh, anyone that I've ever met really only takes a day to figure most of it out. Uh, but the unique thing about Hacks, it's been around for over a decade, the unique thing about Hacks is that from day one it was created to compile to other languages. And if that did not work, it would be like a big scary thing and it, it, it would just be a failure. There was something called particle code, I remember, some time ago. And on the website it said, it's amazing, you can write in Java and you can write in action, action script and you can write in C sharp and you can generate Java and you can generate. And then literally the first sample that I remember reading was a for loop and it broke when it compiled. And they said, see, instead of a for loop, we can turn it into a while loop. And you know, I know not everyone here is technical, but it's basically, <laughs> Instead of saying, hello, how are you? You can say, hey, dude. And like that fixes your code. Isn't this amazing? And it's like, uh, you can't second guess every single thing you do and have this work. But because that works, the really exciting thing, so the number one blocker to anybody using it is that people are like, hacks, what's that? Is that a, in, in German, it's a pork knuckle. So like, <laughs> what is this thing? Uh, but. Once you get past that, because you can write your code once and actually generate JavaScript or generate C Sharp or generate Java or generate C++ and this actually works. With OpenFL, we're able to create an engine where it will go to HTML5. I think OpenFL right now, gzipped is like 40K 
So it goes to JavaScript, and it is JavaScript. You can insert your own JavaScript code in there if you want to. Or we could go to C Sharp and go through and script in. It doesn't work as well, but you can. Uh, or you can go to C++ and be native for mobile and native for desktop or native for consoles. Or we have people who got Node.js working or got C Sharp working or got Java working with whatever else. And so there's all these interesting permutations and possibilities that open up where you could just decide, you know, for this project, I want to build something that runs in C Sharp on top of Unity. Or for this project, I want to make it native and I want it to whatever. So anyway, so that's kind of probably the most unique thing about OpenFL. And OpenFL is, the, is an open source implementation of Flash. So 2D content uses Flash. Uh, you can create content in the Flash IDE, and all of that content will flow straight through, and it's a very familiar environment. But if you don't like Flash, that's fine. It's just a nice toolkit for 2D development. So how does Unity approach multi-platform? I mean, we right now support probably 28 platforms, I think. So it, it, we definitely cover a lot of different devices. Um, and at its core, Unity has a C++ runtime that gives you 3D rendering, a now 2D rendering, a UI system, physics, you know, audio, animation, like the basic building blocks for pretty much any type of game engine out there. Um, and we've put a lot of effort into making sure that that actually runs the same on pretty much every platform we support. There's a few where you know the capabilities are radically different, where it may be somewhat limited, but there's, there's a real effort to make it so that everything actually works the same, looks the same across all those platforms. Um, and this is all wrapped up in our editor so that you can create content in the editor and actually have it look pretty close to the same on all of those platforms. And so, you know, it's there's also this sort of magical moments. I know before I came to Unity, there was a point when we were doing a PlayStation game, but we, for a random reason, we needed a PC build. And so we just switched platform, hit build, and it basically worked just right out of the box, which is, you know, really what you want from a core technology. I think the other piece that sort of enables that is we have the C++ runtime, but we use uh, C Sharp. Well, we use the .NET um, virtual machine to, to do our coding. Um, these days, I think most people use C Sharp, but we also support uh, JavaScript. And um, I think Boo may have gone away, but for a long time, we supported like a variant of Python as well. Um, but the nice thing about the .NET runtime is that it does exactly the same thing on every platform. So you know, one of the challenges, say you use C++ across platform, it mostly does the same thing, but you'll get random weird changes due to different compilers on all those platforms. But we've done, done the effort to kind of make sure that our C++ code actually does do the same thing on all the platforms. And so you can test your code in editor. And in most scenarios, you get exactly the same thing on all the platforms. And so it means that a lot of your developers can just create content and code in the editor and then have it work on the platforms. I mean, there's always edge cases. It's not perfect by any means. But there's, there's definitely, it does give you a good benefit that you can largely expect to author it once and see it do the same thing on all your platforms. So here's my pitch. Um, default is a game engine made by uh, hardcore console geeks. And it was made for uh, top grossing titles, um, biking specifications, pretty much. Uh, so it's a very lightweight game engine. It's uh, designed for the games, say for the mobile game, ship with this engine to launch within a few seconds, like as in two, three, four seconds on iPhone 5. This is real. Uh, all the people with the um, mobiles in their hands just download Blossom Blast Saga and check it out. So um, the engine uh, allows very fast asset loading, easy operations, as in um, very easy to ship new content, operate your game. Like the engine was designed for the titles um, that you know have their residence in uh, top grossing charts. Um, it has an editor. It has the pipeline. Uh, according to the needs of um, small teams, just like we have at King. So it, it has been an internal game engine for two years. It's just that we polished it and, and published it um, publicly, I mean, for everybody to try it out and uh, just make um, very good games. It has an editor, scripting is in Lua, there is debugging on the device, uh, there is something that we call um, 
asset reloading, as in uh, you click that single button, the game appears on your device, then you change something, click the button within, se within a second, the assets, like the assets that you change or the code that you change, refresh on the device, and it's very, very fast to iterate. So fast iterations is also something that is very, very important. Great. Um, I think you touched on a little bit of this, but uh, can you go in a little more depth or in, in terms of what are some of the common trade-offs that developers um, have to deal with um, when selecting a, a cross-platform development, or maybe even some of the trade-offs uh, versus native development? Yeah, I can start. I mean, I think what you said about default is kind of an interesting kind of contrast between the engines. You know, Unity does support a lot of platforms, and that does come with a little baggage, you know, and I think if you have an engine that supports one or two platforms and works really hard to support those well, there's the potential for it to be, you know, faster and more nimble for those platforms. Um, you know, and so I think that is something you want to look at is, okay, what's the range of platforms and what features do we actually need? Um, you know, obviously I would, would still say being slightly biased towards Unity that, you know, having the option of additional features and platforms also gives you more flexibility in the long run. But, you know, if, again, like I said at the start, if you know which platforms you want to target and you want to be very focused and be excellent on those platforms, there's certainly a potential there that you can find a more cut down version. Um, you know, I think also when you start looking at the tools and the ecosystem, you know, a lot of the time you do want to have a fairly full featured tool set to kind of build out your game. But I don't know, maybe you want to do a fully procedural game and so having a game editor is not that big a deal to you and so maybe that opens up other options to go a different direction. You know, I think those are the sorts of things you need to think about when you're getting started with different engines. So my take is like look into the top 10, top 20, top 30 on the iOS, on the top grossing and also on the top downloads and count how many games from the tops are built on a publicly available engine. So most of them, more than half, are, be, uh, are built on own internal technologies. So this is for a reason. So uh, answering your question about internal technologies, you have, like, you, you don't have that much options, or maybe you didn't before default <laughs> appeared. Uh, uh, in, like, when you're making a game that will be downloaded in millions and millions and millions that will have to work properly on uh, gingerbreads, do I have people old enough who know what is gingerbread? That's not a cookie, that's the Android. Uh, that's Android 2, actually. And uh, that's actually the first Android that Unity uh, was, was ported to. Uh, but now it's not supported Unity, for example. And uh, we at King and, and, and people uh, who design like games uh, for, for the top grossing charts, they, they have to consider these uh, low-end devices. They have to consider hardware that is available in China. And they don't have much options except for you know making own uh, engines and adapting for um, uh, like for this hardware for um, for for the people who actually like for the hardware the people use in hands and uh, yeah however um, this mostly makes it like this is correct for if you're making a 2D game if you're making a 3D game. Well, then you're doomed since uh, having a complex 3D game, uh, like creating an engine for a complex 3D game that takes like hmm, good six, eight years, right? Yeah, when I think about trade-offs for different types of development, I think about, there's kind of two contrasts that stick out in my mind. On the one hand, you could create something that's very tightly controlled set of abilities and it's very consistent everywhere that it runs, but that's all it does. We were at the table last night with someone who is in robotics, and he was talking about you know, th products like the Zoomer uh, Dinosaur or Furby or other you know, type of robotic toys for kids, where they only do, there's bullet points, one, two, three, four, and that's all they do. And you aren't really going to expect it to go beyond that, to have machine learning and to build a relationship with you, because it's just not designed for that. So when you have a framework or you have development tools that are built that way, where A, B, C, D, this is what it does, and it's supported, but that's it, in a sense, you've ended up with a toy. 
And so the, the risk there is, did I end up with something that where I'm going to be limited later, where it was all great, 60% of the way, 7 of the way, but you get down towards the end and you realize, oh gosh, we have to integrate this extension or we have to whatever, and there's just no way to do that. And you're done, you know, and, and then all of a sudden that one little thing ruins all of those good experiences and all, all of the positive feelings you had. But on the flip side, what you could end up with is something that's so complex. You know, I could tell you, if you go to Home Depot, you could build almost anything. You could build a house, you could build a, uh, but then you walk in and it's like, uh, do I need the three and a quarter inch bolt or do I need the five inch bolt or, uh, you know, do I need to call an engineer and an architect and all these people to figure out how to put this all together. And then they architect something and then you can't support it. You end up with, I worked at a company and the analogy they used was building a house. And they said, when you build a house, you hire someone who knows how to do it. But once you're done, you shouldn't have to call the contractor back to, to add a sofa, to change the paint color on your walls. You should be able to do that kind of stuff yourself or hire a neighbor kid to do it or something. So finding the right balance between those two is tricky. And so the, the methodology behind OpenFL, the way I've thought about it is like driving a car. Cars are not like a rocket ship or submarine that have dials everywhere. They're designed to be very simple to drive. And maybe a person could think that that kind of you know, I'm smarter than that. I could handle more than one steering wheel or two pedals or, you know, whatever else. But the reality is that by simplifying those controls, it means you can hop in the car and you can think about the speech you're going to give today, the, the document you need to write, the code you're trying to solve, the, the business deal that you're about to do. It, you can multitask while you're driving because it's simple and you can just work on the level of intent. But if you want to, you can open the hood, and if you want it to do a cucaracha when you hit the horn, you can do that. If you want to pimp your ride, you have that ability. No one's locked the hood and prevented you from doing that. So, so anyway, so I believe that one of the benefits of open source is really giving you that ability so that you can try and create an environment where it's simple to use and you can just create whatever you want to create. But when you get down to that point of, I really wish I could just change this one thing or I really wish I could fix this thing, you can bring in an engineer who's clever, who can deal with that piece of code. You can solve that problem. You can make it work exactly the way you want and ship that product perfectly with the cherry on top of however you wanted to do it. Great. Uh, I'm going to shift gears a little bit and um, talk about Flash. It may be a little bit unfair. We don't have anybody from uh, Adobe here, but um, we need to talk about it anyway. Um, Flash has been a popular game development platform for many years and um, the writing's been on the wall for some time that it's going to be going away. Um, most recently Google made an announcement that they'd be disabling uh, Flash content by default in Chrome. Um, I wondered what your thoughts were on the current state of Flash development and um, the next six months. Will, will people be publishing Swift six months from now? <laughs> okay. <laughs> I guess that's a cue for me. Um, well, I think the first thing, so Flash, depending on who you talk to, is a dirty word. Um, you, know, you know, you shouldn't do that in mixed company. <laughs> Don't say that word. Uh, but honestly, I believe that people forget 10 years ago, 12 years ago, how good Flash was. I believe the way I think about it is Flash is like the plug-in victorious. Back in the day, I had the Yamaha XG MIDI plug-in that made my MIDI sound super cool, like listening to Pesh Mode, get the balance right, in Yamaha MIDI made it so much better. Or the, uh, what was it, like the Mission Impossible theme, or other things like that back in the day, back when we had MIDIs on, and frames on our websites, because um, we were cool like that, and future facing. Um, but anyway, so, so the web was created with plugins. JavaScript wasn't very good, the browser was fairly simple, and plugins is really what filled in those needs and made things that just weren't possible possible. The first time I saw a website that had Flash on it, it was like, where did that come from? Especially the first time I saw a website with Flash at 30 frames a second. So changing the defaults from 12 frames to 30 frames, all of a sudden it's like, whoa, that's so smooth and that's so amazing. And you know, Craig came from real networks. We had real player. We've had Java applets. We've had a million different plugins. Unity started as a plugin. So we've had all these different plugins in the browser. And really where we've ended up today is that we don't want plugins. 
that we've built web browsers up, and it's taken over a decade, but we've built web browsers up to the point where we say, we don't need a plugin to deliver these experiences, so why have a plugin when we could just simplify it and do it without? And I think that's okay. And that, to be honest, is, I think, the real issue here. It's not about Flash, it's not about Flash development, it's just about plugins in general. And so, with that in mind, I think that it's important as developers to remember that we are serving the users. We are delivering experiences to them. So it's about how do we take an experience and deliver that to our users and where are they? And what, how, what are they comfortable with? And how do they want to experience this? And so maybe it's on the web, and, but increasingly it's also mobile devices and apps and other types of environments. And that's, that's the number one most important thing. And everything else we do is meant to serve that. And so with OpenFL, we take the Flash development paradigm Anyone who used and loved Flash just loved the workflow, but we don't need the plugin anymore. We can just go straight to HTML5, we can go native for iOS and Android and Windows and Mac and Linux and you know anything else you want to do. Um, so sep decoupling the two, but to me, I think it really just comes down to any plugin. So I have a bit different angle on that. Um, the angle would be from who plays Flash games nowadays? And the second angle is, who is still making Flash games nowadays? Um, so uh, a bit of context here, like why do I care so much? So um, we have a full-fledged, really well working uh, HTML5 runtime. So like when you publish games on default uh, to HTML5, it's like these games loads within seconds and all that. So I was really interested in getting the Flash people saying, hey, like Flash is dying, probably blah blah blah. This is new technology, and uh, whenever I participate in panels and talks, and I, I'm asking like, "Hey, people, who are still working on Flash?" And like, I get very few hands. What about this audience? Who, who does care about the Flash in this audience? Yeah. So, and um, I'm trying to figure out like why, why, like. Who, like them? The, I mean, the buying buying traffic for the mobiles is so expensive. There is so much traffic on the web. It's, it's cheaper. It's like there is Facebook. I mean, it's it's tough, but it's there. And uh, there is Congregate and other things. Why don't you make games on 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 oh, for the web? And um, the answer is. Well, but like people can play on mobiles. It used to be that a person comes to the office, which the Facebook can play again there. Now they all play on the mobiles. And I'm like, okay. So maybe it's not the problem about the technology itself. It's the problem about the players who still play or don't play Flash games anymore. Maybe there is no need for that. So that's, 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 that's not an answer, that's, that, that's a bunch of questions. Uh, but maybe you have something uh, to input here. I mean, I think it's, it's sort of an interesting perspective for me. I'm not, I'm not an expert on Flash at all, but I do think that you know, the whole plugin environment has been pretty interesting. It's, you know, it definitely drove the web, like, you know, and Flash did a great job of getting a huge number of installs. You know, Unity never really came close, and we were still one of the, you know, more installed plugins out there. Um, you know, and I think it. You know, I think you raise interesting points about whether there's actually a viable business model, and whether people actually want to play those games on the web as well. I think. I know certainly inside Unity, we've sort of struggled with how ready the browsers are to not have plugins as well, as much as they're disabling. You know the ability to have something like Flash or Unity as a plugin. You know WebGL is still evolving a lot. You know it's way better than it used to be, but you know it's. You know I feel like they're forcing the issue pretty fast, and maybe that is partly because they see the numbers and people aren't using the plugins as much as they used to. Um, you know so I think you know as always as things change, it's it's sad in some ways like there's a lot of people who want to keep playing their you know op whether it's unity or flash games like you know they have games they enjoy and they're just not going to work pretty soon um you know and there's not really a good way to kind of maintain those and keep them working um but you know i think as always these things evolve and new technologies come along you know i think you know as you 
said, default supports WebGL, you know, Unity as well. So it's you kind of have to evolve with the times and start using the new technology. OK. Uh, I'm going to ask one more question, and then we're going to take a few questions from the audience. So uh, be thinking of questions for these folks. Um, As we know, as game developers, uh, there's a lot that, a lot more that goes into a game uh, than just uh, code for gameplay. Uh, as a business, we have um, a lot of tools that we integrate and um, uh, libraries that uh, interface with uh, in-app purchase mechanisms, um, advertisers, tracking mechanisms. Um, and it can be difficult for developers to integrate these third-party libraries or SDKs into their game. Um, especially when having to do this multiple times across platforms. Can you talk about how development platforms can help ease this for developers and maybe how you approach it? Sure. I feel like this is a bit of a gimme for Unity, but <laughs> I'll, I'll talk about it for You're sure. Um, thank you. Uh, so, I mean, I guess I'll give some perspective on this because, you know, before I was working at Unity, I was running my own game company. You know, we we're small, we only had a few engineers. Um, and you know, integrating any technology, like you didn't really have very much time to do it. Like honestly, if you couldn't download a library and have it kind of working within a day, you just weren't going to do it. You know, it just you just had to move fast. And so you would, if it wasn't working after a day, you'd be more likely to try a different provider and a different library, or at least I was, um, especially when I didn't know for sure which one was going to be the best anyhow. Um, and so, you know, I think the ease of integrating it is a huge part of whether people are going to use different services. Um, you know, and we were a Unity shop, and so we scoured the asset store all the time, and that was a huge benefit because there were so many plugins available there where you could just download it. They came with source code, so you could fix any bugs in it. And so you often could get things up and running very quickly. Um, but the reason why I say this is a gimme is that obviously, you know, a big part of what Unity is offering now are these kind of services and having them fully integrated into the engine. So, you know, we offer ads and analytics. Um, you know, we have cloud build. Um, we have in-app purchase. You know, we have all these things that you have to have for your game, um, and we provide them as just part of our API. Um, they all work together. You know, the analytics, in-app purchase. Um, and the ads can all kind of combine together. And so, you know, it does let you build up this whole stack of tech that you need for most sort of mobile games um, very quickly, and they work nicely together. And so, you know, that's, that's Unity's big push right now is to, you know, we want to enable developer success. And what we basically mean by that is like helping people make money with their games. And so, a big part of that is providing these big chunks of technology that. You know, the big guys have built for themselves and spent a lot of money on, but now we can offer them to every developer out there, you know, at a very reasonable price. All right. Uh, yeah, so, uh, so for OpenFL, I would say that on the HTML5 side, there's a lot of flexibility, especially that I th feel like that's one of the most difficult things to do using a solution like ASMJS in the, in the web is how do I integrate with this with anything else on the website? Especially, I think the other thing that we've seen plugins used on the web and everything else, and a lot of us here are probably developing games that are designed as a let's draw a box on the screen and everything is going to happen inside of that box. But I do think that historically, a lot of this type of content on the web has been kind of co-mingled and intermixed within the site within various sections of the page. And so being able to decouple things and more tightly integrate in that way is definitely a benefit by being able to go to straight JavaScript and having full control over that. As for mobile and other platforms like that, OpenFL has been around long enough that a lot of the, the key extensions there are, are available. You can write pure Java for Android extensions. You can write Objective-C or Swift or C, C++ and so on for iOS. Uh, a lot of different people in the community have developed those extensions, and we've been working to b gather those together so that we're all working together as a community to make one great in-app purchase extension rather than splintering off into multiple different ones. Um, but really, all of this is possible without paying a yearly subscription, without paying, especially if you want to go to consoles, using some platforms will cost you as much as a mobile home. <laughs> or as much as a Bentley or something to go to. And so, you know, some of those considerations are important as well. 
uh, if, if all the extensions you need except for one are there and it costs you a week of development time to get that done, that may be long term is a lot better financially than committing yourself to paying a tax uh, on the, the whole future of your development. So when you're making a bigger game, probably you would launch it on two, maybe three platforms, like four at max, like within a coming year. So you would have quite a limited set of SDK, what you need to integrate. But um, when you're making a um, free-to-play title, especially for, f for the mobiles and maybe for the web, you would actually want to run on just a myriad of app stores. You would have to integrate so much SDKs uh, from the ads, from the partners, uh, like billing. How many just billing SDKs would you, would you want to integrate? So, uh, and like these are the problems uh, that uh, King um, has to fight with. Uh, since like ch check out mm, the King games. I mean they're they're everywhere. And um, so default was created according to these specifications, according to the needs of the teams. Like, hey, like this is the core of our game, and like these are hundred items that we have to ship with certain bills. So this is the metrics. So we have a built-in dependencies manager kind of thing, and uh, it's like so it's uh, so you ship. Like so, we build the metrics of of um, uh, of SKUs, like the the, the units, um, say for Android, that would be APK files, um, according to specific needs. Um, also, we think and like again, like this is our philosophy. This this is how stuff is at, um, on our team. That like normally on the teams, there would be one, maybe two really technical people. And uh, the rest would be less technical, maybe artist. And um, this single, very technical person whose job is actually to program, he needs to hurt like the the artist so that like uh, don't touch this. Like uh, yes, I changed something, and then you have to like to update the editor and you know update the this particular DLLs. Yeah, yeah, and also the Android SDK. Yes, you have to uh, update this uh, as well. So. We feel this is the wrong way to do it. We feel that that single technical person on the team has to focus on um, on actual programming. So he needs to set up the project, the SDKs, like you know whatever the technical things once that it works on his machine. And all the artists, you know, designers and people who don't care and don't know what SDK means, it all should just work on that thing. And that's exactly the approach we're taking. And uh, this is how it works on our side, pretty much. Great, thanks.